Thank you, Will. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to be reading from the prophet Ezekiel and Zechariah in that order. Stand with me as we read from God's Word. If you got your Bible, I believe it's Scripture is all in your bulletin this morning. First of all, from the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. <laughs> We'll begin reading at verse 6. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. This is a river that's flowing from the temple in Jerusalem after Christ's return. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, Arabah, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live, whether the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi, even unto Eneglim. Then or they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. And then from Zechariah chapter 14, verse 8, Zechariah says, And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former or eastern sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word by our heads. We're grateful for the word of God, Lord. Pray that you'll speak to us from it, and for that we will thank you. Amen. You may be seated. We have all heard of the Dead Sea, I'm sure, from sermons, Sunday school lessons and so forth, if not from geography class in school. I guess they still teach geography in the school. They did when I was in school, but things have sure changed since those days, so maybe they don't teach geography any anymore. Anybody know if they do? They still teach it? Okay, that's good. It might come as a surprise to you that what we call the Dead Sea is never called by that name in the Bible. There it is called the Salt Sea. Genesis 14.3 and Deuteronomy 3.17. In our scripture reading here in Ezekiel, it is simply called the Sea or the Sea of Arabah. In the original, King James leaves Arabah out, which means the sea in the desert. Other places it is called the eastern sea or former sea, like Zechariah called it in his reading that we read. In Arabic it is even called the Sea of Lot. Remember him? But we know it is the Dead Sea. And it is called the Dead Sea because as, it na as its name implies, it's dead. Situated some 1,300 feet below sea level, it is the lowest point on dry land on the face of the earth in our world. No life can exist in its ultra-salty water. 
and its shores are coated with a thick layer of salt that kills any plants that might try to grow along its shoreline. Actually, its water, I'm told, is almost, now think of this, ten times saltier than the ocean. Ten times saltier than the ocean. So it certainly lives up to its name as the Dead Sea, or Salt Sea. Now Israel has two seas within its borders. The other one, most of you probably know, is called the Sea of Galilee. It is teeming with life. I'm told it contains 27 species of fish, some that are found nowhere else in the world. It's hard to believe, but both the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are fed by the same water source, the Jordan River. So how can two seas fed by the same water source be so different? The Sea of Galilee is teeming with life. The Dead Sea contains no life. Its water is toxic and bitter. Well, the answer lies in the fact that the Sea of Galilee receives water at the one end where the Jordan flows into it, and then it gives out water at the other end. The Dead Sea, on the other hand, receives the same water, but it has no outlet. It keeps it all for itself, in other words. Now, I hope I don't have to enlarge on that too much to get you to see a great life lesson being taught there. If you only receive but never give, what will your life be like? Some people are takers. Others are givers. Which one of those words would best describe you? Giver or taker? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Apostle Paul tells us <coughs> to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You try giving instead of just taking, you will discover that Jesus was absolutely right by what he said there. So is the Dead Sea always like this? Dead, I mean. No, it wasn't. On the southern end of the Dead Sea is a hill called Mount Sodom in the borders of Israel. On it, Mount Sodom, stands a huge pillar of salt that is known as Lot's wife, according to the Israeli tourism people. They have signs, they'll point you, they'll show you, see that over there? That's Lot's wife. The only problem is, Jordan also has one on the other side of the sea that they, their tourism people call Lot's wife. Now which one is the real one, I cannot say for sure. But according to the historian Josephus, the real one was still standing when he was alive, and he said he had seen it and visited it. Writing in chapter 11 of book 1 in his Antiquities of the Jews, as he wrote about Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt, he said, For I have seen it, and it remains to this day. That's almost 2,000 years ago. But before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, when Lot and Abraham parted, and Lot chose to go in that direction, 
pitching his tent toward Sodom is the way that Genesis 13, 12 describes it. As you've heard me say before, it was a very lush area. That's why Lot chose to go there. Backing up a couple of verses in Genesis 13, 10, it describes the area where the Dead Sea now is as well watered even as the Garden of the Lord, meaning the Garden of Eden. So the whole area changed drastically. There's probably no place on the face of the earth that has changed any more drastically than being like the Garden of Eden and now the Dead Sea. It changed from being a very lush area into a dead, desolate, wasteland area as a, re as a direct result of God destroying the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. Now even though many liberal theologians and preachers today totally dismiss the biblical account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, calling it either a, a myth or a fairy tale, some even say it's an outright lie, God really destroyed those wicked cities. Mm -hmm. Lot's wife was literally turned into a pillar of salt for her disobedience. And the Dead Sea was made dead because of God's judgment on the whole area. <coughs> Fire and brimstone made the entire area into a desert wasteland. Now, of course, the main reasons the cities were destroyed was because of the homosexual culture that dominated the city. Some of you that are as old as me remember the day when every church used to preach that. But many are changing their tune in these days of political correctness. But we should remember that Jesus told us specifically in Luke 17, 32 to remember Lot's wife. One of the shortest verses in your Bible. Everybody can memorize that one. Remember Lot's wife, Jesus said. And he used that as an example of the consequences of disobedience or of not being ready for his coming or of turning back from following him. Now we ought to have enough sense to know that Jesus wouldn't use somebody as an example to remember if that somebody wasn't real. And if what the Bible said about that somebody hadn't really happened. Yes, those words, remember Lot's wife. That is a sermon by itself. That many today in the church who are growing careless need to hear. Jesus also said in Luke 17, 29... But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, it says, and destroyed them all. Jesus, Jesus totally backed up what was written about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and made it clear that its destruction didn't come from some kind of natural disaster. But Jesus said, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. Meaning that God sent it as a judgment for what was going on there. And God's judgment destroyed them all, the entire cities. 
Now the scriptures we read this morning from the prophets Ezekiel and Zechariah, 2,500 years ago at least, they saw this, are very specific in prophesying that there will come a day after the Lord returns when the Dead Sea will no longer be dead. Ezekiel 47 8 says that the waters of the Dead Sea shall be healed. That's the way he describes it. They will be healed because of the fresh, clean water that will flow from the temple in Jerusalem after Jesus returns to the earth. Remember the prophets described how there's going to be a great earthquake. The whole topography of Jerusalem will change. It will split the mountain and a river will begin to flow from out of the rebuilt temple there in Jerusalem. Zechariah 14.8 that we read says, It shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem. Now who was it in John 4.10 who told the woman at the well that he would give her what he called living water? Right then and there. Well, I think you all know it was Jesus, of course. And she didn't have to wait until Zechariah and Ezekiel's prophecy were fulfilled. <coughs> Zechariah 13.1 also says that in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. When Jesus returns to Jerusalem, He will rule the world from there, and living water, the kind that cleanses from sin and uncleanness, will be available to all who want it. Jesus will be the source of it. Remember, the living water, it was Him. He is the living water. So if he's going to be in Jerusalem, well, that's not too hard to figure how living water would flow from Jerusalem if Jesus is there. He'll be the source of it. But this living water will also flow in a newly formed river. It will come directly from out from under the temple. If you back up in those verses in Ezekiel, before we read, Ezekiel tells how he measured it. And it, every time he measured it, it just kept getting a little deeper and a little more. And it literally will heal the toxic water of the Dead Sea. Ezekiel 47, 9 says that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because those waters shall come hither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. The fishing will be so good that verse 10 that follows says that the fishermen will line the banks all the way from En Gedi even unto an eglim. That's roughly 18 miles. Now, if you were to walk down to the Dead Sea today with a fishing pole or a net in your hand, people would laugh at you and think you were some kind of a nut. <laughs> All those people floating around in there because it's, the water is so dense that you can't sink. If they saw you coming with a fishing pole and a net today, they would say, boy, somebody better tell that nut, uh, ain't going to work down here. 
But they won't think that way in that prophesied day. Because if you go fishing in that day, you'd better take a long and large cooler to keep your catch of fish fresh in. Because even if you don't know the first thing about fishing, you'll do all right. There'll be so many fish, the Bible says. Now many times we read some of these things that the Bible says are going to happen and we might be tempted to wonder if they ever will happen since there's no evidence pointing to their <coughs> fulfillment. Now I have seen enough evidence of fulfilled prophecy in my own lifetime with my own eyes that if the Bible says something's going to happen, I believe it's going to happen. Whether there's evidence of it happening yet or not. I'm one of those guys that if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. Simple as, as that. But the prophecies about the dead sea being healed, their future. This isn't going to happen until after the Lord returns to Jerusalem. But something incredible is already starting to happen right now. And nobody is even talking about it. The Dead Sea has been shrinking in size dropping around three feet every year. Heat, condensation, they're taking the minerals out of it, all those things, but it's dropping. And wherever the water has receded, big sinkholes are showing up all around the Dead Sea. I never heard this until just a week ago. A Jewish woman from Jerusalem named Samantha Siegel often takes trips to the desert in remote parts of the Dead Sea area. And on a recent visit, she encountered a site with powerful prophetic implications. She discovered that some of these sinkholes are filling up with sweet, fresh water. Amen. And even more incredibly, she found that fish are swimming around in these bodies of water where the fresh water is coming up in these holes. The proof is undeniable. She has produced a video, which I got off the News from Israel website, in which fish are clearly seen swimming in these sinkholes on the shore of the Dead Sea, and it shows her swimming in one of these pools with green vegetation growing around it, of all things. Now, the devil tried to keep us from seeing this this morning, but thanks Amen. to Waylon, he rigged something up. So we're going to see a little part of this video this morning. I wanted you to see it. Look closely when we see it. Everybody see it? You'll shift the camera over there, Rick. Then. Okay, so folks that will listen on YouTube can see it too. It's only about a, we're only going to show about a minute of it, but it's mind-boggling what she's showing. The Dead Sea. In recent years, okay. just 30 minutes drive east of Jerusalem, and you arrive at the lowest point on the globe, the Dead Sea. In recent years, the sea's been shrinking, and thousands of sinkholes have opened up, some containing sweet, fresh water. From the road, you can even see these ponds which have formed only recently, and small fish now live in these pools. This is a big deal, and no one's really talking about it. 
To me, these are signs of the times when the Dead Sea finally comes to light. We read of a vision for the third temple in Jerusalem in which water starts flowing eastward towards the Dead Sea. And I quote, And it will be that any living thing that will swarm wherever these streams flow will live, and the fish will be abundant, for these waters will come in and they will become sweetened, so that the fish may live wherever the stream comes. It will happen that fishermen will stand by it, from En Gedi to En Eglain. They will be spreading places for nets. Look Their fish will swimming. be of as many species as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly abundant. But in the meantime, and this time sure is me, the opposite's been happening. The only water flowing into the Dead Sea okay. comes from the Jordan River. They better off right there, right? Okay. Okay. Now, you're not supposed to see stuff like that around the Dead Sea. Go ahead and turn the lights back on, Stephanie. You can't get any place where there's green stuff growing. Did you notice the green stuff? You can't swim in the Dead Sea. It is so dense, you, you can't go down in it. And those, I hope you can see it, those are fish swimming around in those pools. There are no fish in the Dead Sea. So how did those fish get there? Obviously God put them there. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. The beginnings of the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Dead Sea being healed are now in place. Just waiting to spring forth. Where are these fish going to come from they're going to catch? God's got them in some nursing pools right there already. Amen. And when that water comes and it all changes, they're going to swim out, and I think those little rascals will breed like crazy. <laughs> the way it sounds. Also, in 2011, a team of researchers from Ben Gurion University sent divers down to the floor of the Dead Sea. Now, that posed serious problems as the super sailing water renders scuba gear inoperable. So, I don't know how they did it. But it was the first time that such a dive has ever been made. But what they found there was equally astonishing. They found huge craters on the sea floor with fresh water flowing up from them. Perhaps the most remarkable, that's it at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Perhaps the most remarkable aspect of this biblical prophecy showing signs of it appearing now in plain sight. This scout told the Israeli government about it. Nobody knew about it until she went out wandering around and found it. And as she states in her video, this is a big deal. <coughs> And at this point, nobody's even talking about it. I agree with her. That is a big deal. Now maybe nobody else is talking about it, but I'm talking about it. <clears throat> You're seeing it. So since the fulfillment of this prophecy isn't supposed to happen until Jesus returns, just how close to His coming must it be getting if we are seeing the means for this prophecy to be fulfilled actually coming to pass, you watched it right with your very own eyes. The fish 
that Ezekiel and Zechariah, I wonder who back in those days said to Ezekiel, you're some kind of a screwball fundamentalist crackpot. There's never going to be fish in the Dead Sea. Don't you know nothing can live there? But 2,500 years ago, the God of Heaven said, write this down in the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in 2016, Christians will look at that and they will say, well, is that going to happen or not? Yep. It's going to happen. Right. <laughs> Even if we didn't see any fish, it's going to happen simply because God's Word says it's going to happen. So if it doesn't happen until the Lord comes, returns to Jerusalem, and the living water flows from Him, how close to that happening must we be? I think the only way to describe it is very close. Perhaps it's a good day for us to remember Lot's wife. It's a good day to say to yourself, do I believe, really believe what the Bible says? Do I believe the things the Bible says are actually going to happen? I hope you do. Because whether or not you believe them, they're going to happen. Whether you believe the Lord's ever going to return to the earth again, trust me, He's going to do it. You say, I don't believe in that rapture stuff. It's going to happen. I don't believe there will be a temple Rebuild in Jerusalem. I saw this week, just this week, the Jews in Jerusalem opened up now a training center to train the priests publicly. They've been doing something on the side where they were showing some things. They actually opened a school this past week to train the priests to do the stuff they're going to do in the temple when they get it built. You don't train somebody for something if it's not going to happen, do you? Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Yeah. Let's stand. <coughs> I hope you believe it. I hope you're ready. If you're not, remember Lot's wife. She wishes she could have had another chance. Day will come when we don't have other chances. <coughs> Bow our heads. We're not going to give an invitation this morning. But my friend, if you are here and you need to wake up, now is the time to do it. Wake up and see what's happening in front of you. Let's join together in a closing word of prayer.